Welcome to Thriller Vault, where thriller writers tell their favorite stories. I'm your host, Phil Williams, and I'm here with my co-host, action adventure author, Luke Richardson. Luke, how are you doing? Yes, very well, thank you. Good to be back. How are you? I'm doing I'm doing well. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate it. Uh, before we get into the story, I want to mention that Luke and I, we have tons of audiobooks. So uh, if, if you want to support the show, if you want to support us, please go to your favorite audiobook retailer and check out Luke Richardson and Phil M. Williams. So without further ado, let's get right into the story. Absolutely. And it's me telling the story today. And today is a story called The Venus Spy Trap. Montmartre, Paris, 1918. Captain Louis Dubois peered down the stone steps one way and then the other. He could see very little in the gloom. Night had fallen some hours ago and darkness now hung over the streets of wartime Paris like a shroud. From the distant light of an upstairs window, Dubois could see the stairs which led him up towards the Sacre Coeur were empty. He glanced at the window from which the only light came emitting a lacklustre glow on the surrounding streets. Dubois stepped further out of his hidden alcove and gazed out across Paris, smouldering below. He saw the spire of Gustave Eiffel's tower also wrapped in the gloom. For a long moment, Dubois remembered watching the tower's construction when he was just a boy. Paris seemed like a different city altogether now, as though the childhood nightmare had crawled out of his head and spread amongst the boroughs and boulevards. Dubois looked down at his left arm, the arm which ended abruptly at the elbow. That was what war did, he realised. It didn't just affect those on the front lines, but also brought great cities to their knees. Sensing a movement in the shadow just down the hill, Dubois was suddenly alert. He slipped back into the alcove, his senses now as finely tuned as the alley cats who fought their feline battle on these streets. The figure moved closer through the darkness. Dressed in a long black coat, the interloper was almost invisible to Dubois. The figure was almost silent too, moving up the steps with a care unnecessary for someone just out for a midnight stroll. Dubois pushed himself further into the alcove to ensure he remained unseen. He slowed his breathing and willed temporary silence upon his beating heart, should the rat-tat-tat that had, against all odds, survived the Somme now give the game away. The figure passed the alcove and continued climbing the stairs. Dubois allowed himself to breathe a temporary sigh of relief, then counted out twenty long seconds before climbing in pursuit. Dubois took each step carefully, placing the soles of his soundless shoes on the worn stone. Above, he saw the figure move through a patch of light spilled from an upstairs window and turn into a small square set in the shadow of the Sacre Coeur. Dubois rushed now, taking the stairs two at a time. He reached the top, just in time to hear the voices. You have it? the first voice said. Dubois ducked in behind the wall of a long-closed restaurant, its windows boarded. As promised, the second replied. From his position, Dubois could see neither speaker, but could sense they were near. He also couldn't tell which was the man he'd followed, and which had been here already. That didn't matter. What was important was that his tip-off was correct. Growing in confidence, He risked another look around the corner. He could just about see two figures. One was tall and lean, almost gaunt or ghostly looking. A wide brimmed hat obscured the tall man's face and a long coat hung down to his ankles. The other man was short and barrel shaped. The short man removed a tightly wrapped package and handed it across. I trust this will end our involvement, the taller figure hissed. Dubois sensed a German accent, although they were both speaking his native French. It will as soon as the payment is complete, the shorter man replied nervously. Dubois's mind raced. The package, no doubt, contained critical information, 
troop movements, supply routes, or artillery placements. If this intelligence reached the enemy, the consequences could be dire. Silently, he withdrew his revolver from its holster. The weapon felt cool and powerful in his remaining hand. The taller man produced a small bag and handed it to the shorter figure, who greedily snatched it. Dubois stepped from the shadows, levelling his revolver at the two men. Police! Freeze! he commanded, his voice made of steel. The two men spun around in alarm, the shorter one dropping the bag, sending coins rolling in all directions. Hands where I can see them! Dubois barked sharply, his aiming somewhere between the two figures so that he could shoot at either with a moment's notice. The shorter man obeyed, but the taller clearly had other ideas. In a swift, fluid motion, the tall man drew a pistol from his coat. Not waiting to aim, the tall man squeezed off several shots as he swung the gun towards the bois. The gun roared, echoing through Mamatra's dead, quiet streets. The action had the desired effect. Dubois dove for cover. He thumped hard against the ground and felt a bullet sizzle just inches past his skin. Dubois didn't delay, however. He rolled across the ground and swung his weapon towards the German. He let his own weapon howl through the night now, sending several slugs after the man, but hit nothing but stone. The German darted away, his coat billowing out behind him like an apparition from the underworld. The Frenchman, clearly less confident with conflict, turned and fled in the other direction. Not wasting the time to fire into the dark, Dubois climbed to his feet. He swivelled from the direction the German had disappeared to face the retreating Frenchman. Something in Dubois's guts told him to go after the Frenchman. Germans were the enemy. They were expected to be devious and underhanded. One of his countrymen, on the other hand, Dubois expected to do what was best for France. Anyone who didn't needed to feel the full weight of the law. And that was why Dubois did what he did. With his heart pounding in his chest, he sprinted after the fleeing figure. As he raced through the dimly lit streets, past shuttered shops and under wrought iron balconies, Dubois's mind was sharply focused. He could hear the rapid footfalls of the Frenchman echoing off the cobblestones somewhere ahead. They darted down Rue Le Pic, the vibrant street that, in brighter times, bustled with artists and vendors. Maybe one day it would bustle once more, Dubois hoped. The Frenchman reached another set of steps and climbed frantically. Dubois paused at the bottom and fired twice, forcing his quarry to duck, but hitting nothing. Dubois scowled and pushed on, hammering up the stairs several at a time. At the top of the stairs, the fleeing Frenchman paused and glanced over his shoulder. For a second in the darkness, he locked eyes with Dubois. Both men froze, caught in a game of cat and mouse. The man tore his gaze away from Dubois and darted on. Dubois reached the top of the stairs and saw the other man running for a stone railing. Now, in the shadow of the Sacre Coeur Cathedral, the man was trapped with steep drops on both sides. Dubois grinned to himself. The man had cornered himself. Stop! There is nowhere to run! Dubois shouted, once again bringing his gun to bear. But the man didn't stop. He ran full pelt towards the railing. For a second, it looked as though the Frenchman was going to stop. But he didn't. He strode up his foot connecting neatly with the top of the railing, and then continued off the other side. For a second there was silence, then a distant crunch, like the sound of gunfire several miles away. Dubois ran up to the railing and peered down the other side. Fifty feet below, the shattered remains of the Frenchman's body lay sprawled out on the pavement. Is that you going out again, Louis? The voice boomed through the apartment on Rue de Salouse. Dubois froze with his hand on the door and peered down at his feet. The heavy boots that his position required had given him away. Oui, grand mère, I have a meeting with the commandant. I must not be late. Wait, wait, let me have a look at you. The shuffling sound of the old woman climbing from her chair reverberated through the apartment. She appeared at the door her wrinkled face surrounded by hair the colour of winter clouds. Yes, 
Very smart. Very smart indeed. The gloves even give you air. Grandma's fingers twitched, as though trying to pull the word from the air. A certain something. Anyway, you look every bit the captain. Dubois glanced down at his left forearm. For official meetings, he wore the prosthetic and disguised the useless rubbery appendage with a pair of gloves. For a moment, Dubois remembered the shell that had taken his hand and three of his closest friends at the same time. The familiar slime of nausea climbed inside his throat as the explosion once again flashed in his mind's eye. Dubois had been in the Hospital Val de Grace for nearly six months after the explosion, an experience which was probably worse than the trenches itself. He'd seen men unable to eat because parts of their faces were missing, those who had to be fed by nurses because they had no limbs left, and some who were unable to crawl out from under the beds for racking fear of imaginary bombs. These men had been the pride of France, and now they were little more than useless. And these men were supposed to be the lucky ones, Dubois had been told many times. Yes, every bit the captain, Grandmère repeated, running a hand across his shoulder as though removing something from the fabric. Merci, Grandmère, Dubois said, his voice firm. Now I must go. Wait, wait, Grandmère roared. I have something for you. I've knitted a scarf for Madame Pompidou. Would you mind dropping it over? Grandmère, I really must go. I'm already late. Nonsense, Louis. The commander won't mind you doing a favour for your old grandmère, will he? What is France coming to if a grandson can't drop a parcel at the house he is walking past? Dubois scowled. He knew his grandmother was right. He did have to go directly past Madame Pompidou's house. Why can't you go yourself, grandmère? Madame Pompidou lives just four houses away. Grandmère's eyes opened wide and then closed to slits. And risk going out there? I will not go outside with this war plaguing the country. Dubois knew that his grandmère hadn't left the apartment in several years. He brought home everything she needed, and somehow she even sweet-talked the doctor into making private visits. All she did, from what Dubois could tell, was sit in her room and knit countless scarves for friends and relatives around the city, which he was tasked with delivering. She pointed towards the door. How would you feel if the Germans invaded and I was carted away to one of those war prisons? They're not likely to take you as a prison of war, Grandmère. And why not? What is wrong with me? Grandmère put her hands on her hips and craned her neck upwards towards her grandson. I, I haven't got time for this now, Dubois snapped. Bring me the parcel. Unable to get the necessary anger into his voice. Grandmère grinned, shuffled with surprising speed back to her room and emerged a moment later with a brown paper parcel. Dubois scrutinised the item. It was very similar to those she'd had him deliver every week or so. Carefully wrapped and tied with string, Dubois read Madame Pompidou's name on the top. Why does Madame Pompidou need all these scarves anyway? Dubois asked. You seem to be sending her one every week. She has a big family. What is it to you? Grandmère snapped, now shooing him towards the door. Get out of here. The commander will be waiting. Nice of you to join us, Dubois. Commander Le Creux roared as Dubois shuffled into his office. Dubois raised a hand in apology and took a seat as quickly as he could. He thought for a moment about explaining that donning a uniform with one hand took much longer than anyone could imagine but he doubted Le Creux would care. Le Creux was hard, ruthless, and accepted no excuses. Firstly, thanks to Dupois, France will sleep with one less raton beneath her bed tonight. Le Creux pointed at Dubois, and the other men assembled in the office glanced at him, some in congratulation, some in jealousy. But I fear this will make no difference. La Creux slammed the desk so hard that a cigar bounced from the ashtray. He stared hard at Dubois. Blood pounded in Dubois's cheeks with frustration. He had wanted to detain the man, but that had not been possible. 
If we were able to question the raton, then maybe we would have some answers. As it is, we have another body in the morgue. And let me tell you, France has enough dead men already. Enough dead men for 100 lifetimes. La Crew paused to impress the seriousness of their mission upon the assembled men. He picked up the cigar and filled his mouth with smoke. Then, exhaling, he continued, Explain to me, gentlemen, how this spy, who calls himself Venus, is always one step ahead. He is always leaving us for dust. A few months previously, they had achieved something of a breakthrough and intercepted one of the communications from Venus. The letter had told them the name, but little more. La Cru eyed each of the ten or so men assembled in his office in turn. Each man stood or sat a little straighter as they met the commander's gaze. With Venus at large, the Germans know what we are doing even before we do. They are ahead of us every turn. La Cru's voice grew sharper as he listed out the battles. At Argonne, they fortified their defences days before we launched our surprise attack. At Assane, they managed to redirect the reinforcements right before our main thrust was intended. And then, at Emerns, they miraculously avoided our planned encirclement, as if they knew precisely our movements. Dubois, feeling the weight of Le Creux's glare, tried to avoid direct eye contact. He focused on a point just above the commander's shoulder. One officer, Lieutenant Moreau, nervously cleared his throat. Sir, we've doubled our efforts in intelligence and counterintelligence. We've changed our codes, even gone as far as employing local pigeons for some of the most sensitive messages, thinking they might be intercepting the wireless. La Cruz slammed his fist on the desk again, this time hard enough to knock the cigar onto the tabletop. It is not enough. It is not enough. Gentlemen, there is a leak. Somewhere in our ranks, someone is feeding information to the enemy. We must find the leak, and we must stop it now. Captain Dubois slowly raised a hand. Commander, if I may, we need to think like them. We need to anticipate their move rather than react to their last. Perhaps may I suggest a deliberate spread of misinformation that would test our own ranks. La Cruz looked at Dubois, his stern face momentarily softening, appreciating the captain's forward thinking. Go on, Dubois. We feed different information to different units, plans for supposed offences. When the Germans respond, we'll know where our leak is. Commander Le Creux nodded, musing over the idea. Good idea. Make it happen. Dubois rubbed his face and looked up from his desk. Through the glass, the sky was beginning to lighten. He looked again down at the papers before him. Despite several weeks' work, with very little rest, they were no closer to finding the source of the leak and identifying Venus. As planned, they had tried feeding different information to various departments within the organisation. The Germans were still one step ahead and outmanoeuvring them at every angle. And with every failure of their team to get ahead, La Cruz became more angry, threatening, demotion or even removal from the force altogether to anyone who didn't come back with results. Dubois glanced at the stump which had once been his left arm, and imagined himself demoted to a dark government office, pushing around paper for the next 30 years. There was no way he could do that, no way at all. He didn't go all the way to hell and back to be a mere civil servant. Dubois' catastrophizing was cut off midway through when the door creaked open behind him. Dubois turned and saw Grand Mare shuffling in, carrying a pot of coffee on a silver tray. Dubois couldn't help but soften at her presence. What is all this mess? Grandmere said, sliding a pile of papers to the side to find a place for the coffee. This looks like the desk of an anarchist, not a captain of the military police. Dubois felt as though he were a child again being scolded by his grandmother. No wonder you are having trouble with what you are working. Grandmere poured out the coffee which steamed, 
and filled the scruffy room with its rich smell. I know, Grandmère, this is a tough one. We are struggling to find... De Bois stopped, knowing he was unable to tell anyone the details of their investigations, even his Grandmère. That was the rule. Grandmère placed both her hands on his upper arm. Don't say any more, she said, reading his thoughts. But let me tell you this. When your father got into difficulties like this, he would tidy his office. He always said a tidy office meant a tidy mind, or something like that. With that, Grandmère shuffled across the room. At the door, she paused and turned. I noticed that maintenance man again today. He was lurking outside our apartment when I opened the door for the postman. He is indeed a strange one. You said you would have a friend. Check him out. Yes, yes, of course, Grandmère. With all that's going on, it totally slipped my... All at once, Grandmère's words jolted Dubois awake. Dubois turned and looked hard at the woman, all his tiredness gone. Wait a minute. You said you saw him here again. Yes. I told you this last week. You said it was probably nothing, but you would ask one of your colleagues just to be sure. Grandmère shrugged as though the information was nothing. De Bois thought back. He remembered his grandmère saying something about their apartment's maintenance guy. His mind had been so full and chaotic that he hadn't really been listening. Come, sit down, he beckoned grandmère towards a chair. All fatigue dissipated. He berated himself for missing something so obvious. If someone was spying on him, personally, maybe sneaking in while Grandmère took a nap, or listening while Dubois met with his colleagues, that would explain why Venus was always one step ahead. They would know everything. Tell me what you saw, Dubois said. Don't miss out a single thing. Dubois grabbed a sheet of paper and pen. Grandmère scowled as though the implication she might miss something out was an offensive one. I was sitting in the chair by the window, knitting, and I heard the doorbell. I walked to the hall and answered the door. It was Mr. Bernard, the postman. You know, he is such a nice man. He would do anything for you. His parents live in Lyon, you know, and... Grandmère, what did you see apart from Mr. Bernard? Dubois prompted. Grandmère nodded in a way that said, You told me you wanted every detail, and then continued. Well, it wasn't until Mr. Bernard has gone that I noticed him, that new maintenance guy, or at least that's who he said he was. He was standing in the hallway, playing around with one of the lights. But, Louis, I know he wasn't fixing anything. He was just watching, watching our door like a cat watching a mouse hole. Dubois's pen scratched across the paper as he noted down her words, each detail painting a clearer picture of the situation. How did he react when he saw you? Dubois said, prompting Grandmère for more. He looked air uh, startled, like I'd caught him doing something he shouldn't. That's what first made me suspicious. He mumbled something about the electrics and scurried off down the hallway. De Bois sat back in his chair, his mind racing. With someone that close by, it was no wonder Venus was always two steps ahead. De Bois leaned forward and whispered, But, but you've seen him more than once, no? Yes, yes, many times. A cleaning a floor there, tampering with something there. But this is the first time I've actually caught him watching our door. Grandmère leaned forward, locking eyes with Dubois. He was close enough to hear everything. Have you ever seen him speaking with anyone? Dubois said. Grandmère looked thoughtful for the moment. I don't think... Wait a minute. Yes, last week, actually. I saw him from the window, talking to a man in the street. I've never seen that man before. Dubois scribbled that down. Can you describe the man he was speaking with? Dubois said, urgently. Of course, I remember him well. He was strange looking and certainly not from our building. I have lived in soissons crater Rue de Salis, over fifty years now, and I know everyone, and no one has moved in since the Bouchies on the fourth floor. What did he look like? Dubois said as softly as he could, urging Grandmère back to the point. 
an interesting man, certainly. He was tall and thin, with a gaunt face. Now, Grandmère's words slapped Dubois into focus. Thin and tall, with a gaunt face, was exactly how he had described the German who had eluded him that night up at Montmartre. Grandmère, you are wonderful, Dubois said, almost shouting. He leapt up, kissed Grandmère on the forehead, grabbed his coat and bolted for the door. You are going out, Grandmère shouted as Dubois ran for the door. I must, I must see Le Creux, Dubois said, crossing the hall in a single step. But wait, but wait, I have a scarf that needs taking to Madame Drand. Grandmère threw her arms in the air as it became clear that for once, her grandson had made it out without taking a scarf with him. I need to see Le Creux, Dubois shouted, running into the commander's office almost an hour later. The startled receptionist looked up from her work and blinked a few times. Now it's urgent, he shouted again. Slowly, the receptionist climbed to her feet and disappeared through the door and into the commander's office. The Bois stood, his chest heaving with urgency, his one good arm clenched into a fist. His face was flushed from his hurried ascent up the winding stairs of the precinct, and his heart raced, not from exertion, but the pounding drum revelation that beat within his mind. The maintenance man is working for Venus. Moments later, the door swung open, and the receptionist beckoned Dubois inside. Inside the office, Commander Le Creux sat behind his desk, reading a document. He placed the document on the tabletop with the reverence of a preacher and looked up. Dubois noticed how tired his superior looked, his stern face marked with lines that told of too many sleepless nights. A clock ticked loudly, and somewhere outside, a trolley rumbled down a corridor. What is it, Dubois? Le Creux demanded, his deep voice echoing. This had better be worth the interruption. Dubois stepped forward, standing tall. Sir, he began, his voice steady despite the rush of adrenaline. I believe I have a lead on Venus. I know how they're getting information, and I'm sorry to say that it is a direct threat to our operations, right under our own roof, or rather, my own roof. Dubois, you are mumbling. Get to the point. La Cruz sighed, clearly not bothering to hide his frustration. Dubois met the older man's calculating gaze, then looked away. The ticking of the clock on the wall grew monstrously loud in the sudden, stifling silence. There has been a man lurking around my building, sir, Dubois began, telling the crew of the conversation with Grand Mayor. We must act now, before there is any more damage done. La Cruz listened in silence, and then looked down at the paper on his desk. We do nothing, La Cruz said, slowly. The man sounded each word out as though he were speaking a foreign language. His hands clenched, although motionless, on the tabletop. What? Dubois yelled, for a moment forgetting he was addressing a superior. We must act now. This is a serious threat to the security of France. We are on the cusp of exposing Venus, the most elusive traitor to our country. We cannot simply stop. La Cruz raised a hand, steady and calm, then pointed down at the paper on his desk. Dubois, this war is at an end. Both sides are exhausted. We are exhausted. There is an armistice in progress, which in the next few weeks will be signed, and hopefully peace will resume. Dubois took a step backwards, reeling from the words. Could the war really be over? The war that had cost them all so much? Then the memories of the Somme raged within him and fire burned in his eyes. But, 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 but we still have time to catch this snake within our ranks, sir. Such crimes must not go unpunished, armistice or not. For a split second, Dubois met the older man's gaze. Dubois saw something of a flicker there, a spark of rebellion perhaps, 
or the agony of a choice that pained the commander as deeply as any wound. Then Lacrosse sighed, and again glanced down at the paper on his desk. When Lacroix spoke, his voice was softer than any words Dubois had heard him use in the past. Oh, we have fought a long, brutal battle. We are all weary. We have lost much. I understand your fury. Truly, I do. But we must look at the peace that now lies ahead and trust in the justice that will follow. Dubois' shoulders slumped, the fight draining out of him as quickly as it had ignited. Very well, Commander, Dubois whispered, failing to keep the disappointment from his voice. He turned to leave, and then La Croix spoke. This is over, La Croix said softly. Try to live your life now. You are one of the lucky ones. Almost two months later, on November the 11th, 1918, the Armistice Agreement was signed and the Great War was officially at an end. From his apartment on Rue de la Soules, de Bois heard the news with the disconnected nonchalance of someone who was not invited to the celebration. The last two months had not been good for the Dubois household. Shortly after his meeting with La Croix, Dubois' grandmère had taken to her bed and barely got up again. With each day thereafter, the old woman's spark seemed to dulled like a candle in its dying moments. Grandmère, the war, it is officially over. The agreement was signed this morning, Dubois said, pacing into his grandmother's room. The noise of celebration floated through the windows. Despite the coming winter weather, Dubois had no doubt the party would continue for several days and several nights. I am glad to have seen the end of the war, Grandmère said. I always wanted that. Dubois arranged the cushions and helped his grandmother to sit up. For a moment, he almost didn't recognize her, so frail and so tiny in the big bed. He handed his grandmother a coffee and then helped to steady her hands as she took a sip. Dubois placed the coffee back on the nightstand and then passed her a tissue. The frail woman dabbed at her papery lips. Then she looked at Dubois with a stare so intense that for a moment Dubois saw her as the feisty family matriarch she had been for all those years. I am not long for this word, Louis. No, grandmère, Dubois began, not yet ready to accept the truth. This is just an illness. You will recover soon and then... Grandmère held up a hand to silence her grandson. I don't have time for your pointless optimism, she said. The truth is obvious to everyone but you. While I still can, there is something you must know. Dubois choked away his grief. His brow furrowed in concern. From the street below, a group of people broke into a drunken and discordant rendition of La Marcelle. What is it, Grandmère? You can tell me anything. De Bois didn't have the strength to speak in anything but a whisper. Grandmère took a deep breath, as though gathering strength for what she was about to say. I am Venus, she said, her voice even. De Bois took a step back, his face morphing into a look of concern, and then amusement. I was the one passing information to the Germans, Grandmère said, as though Dubois might have forgotten the code name. Then, Dubois had no idea where it came from, but he laughed. He tilted his head back and cackled up towards the ceiling. Grandmère had always had a wicked sense of humour, but this was something else. After he realised she was not laughing too, he glanced at her. Grandmère's gaze was as hard and as cold as those winters in the Somme. All the colour draining from his face, Dubois grabbed his grandmother's hands. He could feel her brittle bones beneath the rubbery skin. Grandmère was an old lady, 
Not a war-hardened spy. Grammet, you can't be serious, De Bois said, finally. It is not possible that you are passing information. For many reasons. You are confused. What reasons? Grammer snapped, pulling her hands away with surprising speed. Well, De Bois glanced around the room, just to break Grandmère's stare. You didn't know any secrets to begin with, and even if you did, you haven't left this apartment in years. The walls seemed to narrow as De Bois looked back at the frail old lady. I always told you to tidy up that office, Grandmère said slowly, but every day you would leave important documents just there on your desk. Yes, because you were always here, De Bois said. No one would break in and go in my office while the apartment was occupied. De Bois's throat felt dry. Every report, every secret operation. He had been exposing his own team without knowing it, all through the one person he trusted most in the world. But still, De Bois said, I don't understand. How would you do this? You haven't left the apartment in years. Grandmère's face now melted into a grin. For a moment, De Bois thought she was going to prod him in the ribs and burst out laughing. Instead, she pointed a bony finger across the room at a box on the dresser. Fetch me my knitting things, she said. De Bois did what he was asked and placed the box on the bed between them. With surprising strength and dexterity, Grandmère pulled open the box and dug out a half-complete scarf. She shook the scarf out and then spread it on the bed between them. You see the lines here? Grandmère ran a bony finger across a row of stitches, tracing a subtle pattern that De Bois had never noticed before. Each knit and pearl seemed ordinary on its own. But put together, they formed a sequence that suddenly made De Bois' heart race. These are not random, Grandmère continued her voice, steady but soft. These stitches are a code, a secret language that I use to send messages. She looked up to meet De Bois' shocked gaze, her eyes reflecting a deep and painful truth. I was the leak, she whispered. I was the unseen thread connecting both sides of this terrible war. I was Venus. The bedroom around him suddenly started to spin. De Bois clung onto the bed for support. All of those scarves you kindly delivered for me had codes written in them, Grandmère said, putting the scarf which would now never be completed back into the box. But... But I just don't understand, De Bois's tongue felt too big for his mouth. Why would you do that? Anger and confusion and betrayal swirled inside him. I was injured, De Bois said, looking at his arm, and millions were killed, and you were helping the enemy. And don't be so emotional, Grandmère muttered. Millions were killed on both sides. There were German mothers whose sons never came home, just as there were here in France. The people I worked with understood that better than most. Grandmère coughed, a great <laughs> hacking cough. De Bois handed her a handkerchief and she held the fabric to her lips. When she removed it a minute or two later, it was bloodstained. Our mission was to keep a sort of status quo between the two sides, Grandmère continued. That was the best way to save lives on both sides, you see. No party could be more powerful than the other. We knew that if balance was maintained, eventually world leaders would see the stupidity of their campaign and peace would come to Europe again. De Bois looked from his grandmère to the scarf on the bed between them. As the jubilant cries of the reborn city rang out below, all he felt was numb. Two weeks later, Captain Louis Dubois watched as his grandmère's coffin was lowered into the ground. It was one of those frosty Parisian mornings on which even the trees seemed to shiver. 
The friends and family who surrounded him looked on with solemn faces, their breath visible in the cold air. Between his hands he clutched the unfinished blue scarf. As the priest intoned the final blessings, Dubois glanced down at the scarf. Then the feeling of the first snowflakes of winter tingled his skin. Dubois wrapped the scarf around his neck and wandered in the direction of Montmartre. And there you are, the Venus spy trap. <laughs> Great job. That was good. I kind of suspected her. <laughs> oh, no. Like, I wasn't sure. I wasn't. I, I, I figured it was probably not, but I was, I was thinking, I was like, you know, she's, he's delivering all these packages and, you know. Uh, but I, I like the, the rationale that she had for doing what she did. You know, there's, I, I think with, with, in war, there's so much, uh, uh, there's so much propaganda from one side that you think the, that people think, well, the other side is evil. Mm. You see that a lot here in the States with the, you know, Ukraine and Russia, and they'll just say, well, uh, you know, Russia's evil. And, uh, but meanwhile, they don't know a lot of the circumstances around, uh, rationales for the invasion and everything else. I mean, it's, they both sides have very, strong reasons for doing what they're doing and they're not uh, and and both sides are all, oftentimes right and wrong it's just mm. a very ugly complex thing that war and usually in is in the so. case that you've said there and i think it's probably the same in sort of france and germany because they share such yeah. a close border you know there are right. there are towns that are split on the border there are town there, there are villages that are just have a yeah. river between them and one is you know so they're neighbors in so many ways they share so much and yet can be so divided as well. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was, that was really good. I, the, you did a good job with the accents. I mean, I, I'm so bad at, I don't even, I, I don't even, even think the about accents. that when I wrote it, I thought, you know, when you're writing something, you don't think about the accent so much, do you? And then you think, Oh no, no I've got to read this now. About turned back half an hour ago. <laughs> yeah. That's the thing I struggle with. I, you know, I wanted to try to make the character sound different, but I'm, I'm just not, it's, it's a, it's a difficult talent. And that's one of the reasons why I hire somebody to do my audio books because it's just, it is a real talent. I think, mm. but yeah, that was, that was good. You did a good oh, job good. of when, when you were speaking, I could visualize the person based on, you know, the accent, which was, I, which is what you want, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the, yeah. that's the, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I enjoyed it. It was good fun. It was good fun. I, I came yeah. up with the idea for that. Um, Based on the the grandma who who puts the code in the knitting, I thought that was just a really neat idea because you you think you see the the image of the grandma knitting in the chair by the window. Right. No one would question her. No one would think anything of it, you know. And then the story sort of grew out of that. When I thought, right, why would she? What would she be transport? What would she be saying? You know, what would she be? Yeah talking about <laughs> there were there were lots of female spies in world war ii and probably world war one I. I don't know about world war one specifically but i've read about spies in world war ii that were female and i guess in a lot of ways they would probably make better spies you know more inconspicuous um probably better at 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 navigating social situations to procure information mm. um, so yeah you know. Men are usually time. looser tongued around women than they probably should be. <laughs> That's probably so true. Yeah. You can yeah. use their, 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 <laughs> their, their feminine wiles to get some information out of you. That's right. So. That's right. So, yeah. <laughs> but never, I'm so I've never heard, I, I'm sure there probably was a grandmother out there that was a spy. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that, is that something that, that was, that, is there any basis in truth no, for this story? There's or? no basis no. in truth in it. I, I just thought it would be a, an interesting idea to explore. I'm certain there, there, there must be over the course of one conflict or another. But yeah, I, yeah. Uh, not that I know of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it was a great story. I appreciate it, Luke. Thank you so much. No Anything problem. Anything else you wanted to add before we... Uh... No, no, I hope you enjoyed it. And obviously all of my audio books and other books are on the website, LukeRichardsonAuthor.com. So yeah, I look forward to sharing excellent. some other stories with you. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, and thank you to the listeners and watchers for listening and watching. And uh, hopefully you guys can uh, stick around. We'll, we'll have another show next week. And be sure to like, share, and subscribe.